promise. All right, folks, well, before we dive into God's word, let's pray together. Dear gracious and holy God, Father, we come to you now before your throne to once again dive into what it means to know about you. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us, for the Holy Bible, that we may read it and by the power of the Holy Spirit understand what it says and understand how to apply it to our lives and how to apply our lives to your kingdom. Father, I pray now that by the power of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us, that we would be able to correctly interpret your word, God, so that we can apply it to our lives, so that we can apply our lives to your kingdom. Father, I step out of the way. God, and I pray that you would just make your message known. Father, we love you and we praise you. God, I thank you for the forgiveness of sins. And Father, I pray that you'd forgive me of mine. And it's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we do pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, today is going to be one of those days where we have uh, quite a few scriptures to go through. So I invite you to turn to God's word with me, but I also invite you to write down these scriptures so that you can home and study them for yourself. Um, today, today we're going to learn a little bit about the founding of this country. I want to read to you something. I just want to tell you something. See, back on July 4th, 1776, this group of 56 radicals got together and signed a document. And this document said many things, but perhaps the most progressive and the most radical thing that it could have said was that we believe these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal and are endowed by the Creator certain unalienable rights. Among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What a concept. What a concept that at the time was foreign to the world, and unfortunately, we are moving towards a time where that concept is growing again to be foreign. The right to life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. See, there are many people that are attacking this country, both from without and from within America, because they wish to see us fail. They wish to see us fall. Why? Because we are a nation that has been blessed by God. And we are a nation that has founding principles within the Word of God. And so I believe, I'm going to be honest with you, when I see our flag, our flag that has draped the coffins of many soldiers, our flag that has stood through many battles, our flag that has stood as a symbol of freedom for half a world over, I do see a flag that reminds me of a country that has lost its way. But I don't believe the answer to a country that has lost its way, that was blessed by God, is to abolish this country, but rather go back. We must go back to our founding principles. We must go back and study what our founding father did. We must go back and we must study the reason why they put those three liberties specifically in the Declaration of Independence that 56 treasonous radicals signed, the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. We're going to look at those three attributes today, and we're going to actually see how God values those three attributes. And that is the reason that our founding fathers put that in our founding documents. Because believe it or not, we do live in a country that was founded based off of people of Christian mind with Christian hearts. Why? It says our rights were endowed to us by our Creator. 
Unfortunately, we have made many efforts to remove the Creator from the country that He has created. But we're going to see, through the lens of Scripture, the foundings of this country, and hopefully we're going to see why the future of this country lies in its past, not in its abolition. Number one, the right to life. It's a very simple phrase. It's a very simple concept. It basically means the right to live, the right to be alive. Nobody has the right to take another person's life. Nobody has the right to kill another individual. We are all uniquely created beings, prized of God. Where do we see this? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. I want you to see when our Creator gave us this right. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 7, and it says, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That's an important distinction. A living soul. Because no other creature got that distinction, a living soul, except for man. I'll tell you a no, uh, another distinction that no other living creature got, and it was that we were made in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 24. Sorry, verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God gave us the right to life. In fact, he gave us the ability to even live. He is our creator. Now, nobody in here can create another living soul outside from God. Therefore, none of us have the right to take a soul from this earth except from God. Where do we see this right upheld? It was first upheld in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 7. I want you to listen. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 through 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband, and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Now you may be asking yourselves, Parker, where do I see the right to life in this passage? Where do I see God upholding the right to life in this passage? Well, I want you to listen to this, okay? Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 17 but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, what does it say? Thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. This is a foreign concept to man. Man didn't know what death was, let alone what beheld him whenever he ate of the fruit. When man ate the fruit... Instead of man dying that day, the Greek word thanatos, instead of man dying that day, what do we see? God extends his life. He lives the next day and then the next day. Now, I want you to understand this doesn't make God a liar because mankind did surely die that day. Our souls, which were once alive, died. The Bible says that we, our, our souls are condemned, are dead in our sins and in our trespasses. And from that day, mankind will surely die. Adam and Eve would not live forever like they would have if they had not eaten of the fruit. But instead of them dying that day because they disobeyed a righteous and holy God, God extended their right to life. Therefore, we as individuals, we do not have the right to take other people's lives simply because they do something wrong to us or simply because they do something we don't like. A government does not have the right to take its citizens' lives, which is one huge reason why they put this in the Declaration of Independence, the right to life. 
Why did God not kill them? Why did they not die? Well, as we just read, they were made in the image of God and God gave them dominion over all the earth. Folks, we as human beings are God's prized creation. No other creature is made in his image. No other creature did he extend salvation or have his son die on the cross for. God loves us. And I'm going to tell you something else too. Before you were formed in the womb, God knew who you were. Not only did God know who you were, but God loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross for all the future sins your unborn self was going to commit. And yet, unfortunately, we live in a country that kills unborn souls, that God has declared people, that God has declared that he knew before he formed them. Didn't say he formed them out of the womb, does he? He formed them in the womb. So that's one thing that we've got to go back to. It's in our founding document to recognize the right to life, but we have forgotten that in 1976. Close to 80 million unborn children. We need to return. We need to, what did I say? Go back. Amen. Amen. God values our lives as it, and listen to me, he values our lives as it pertains to his glory. James 4, 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. When we are to live and we are to live our lives, we aren't to live our lives in such a way that is just pleasing to us, but in a life that is pleasing to God. We are to submit, submit our lives as living and holy sacrifices unto the living and holy God. And when we do this, we're going to see these next two virtues applied. The first virtue that I want to, the second virtue, sorry, get ahead of myself here, or I guess behind myself, the right to liberty, the right to life and the right to liberty. Many often question America's foundings because we put this right to liberty that all men are created equal and are endowed by the creator, the right to life and liberty. Many people question this country's founding because at that moment we did not free the slaves. It was true that America at that time had slaves as did every other modernly European country at the time. Yet, what this means is that our founding fathers foresaw a future without slavery and went ahead and laid the groundwork by placing these words in the Declaration, that all men are created equal and have the right to life and to liberty. They recognized the immediate need of a free country superseded the need for free individuals. Yet these progressive ideas of the right to life and liberty were laid with full intent of future freedom for all individuals. And folks, freedom, liberty, to be free is something that our Heavenly Father desires. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. If you are free from all contracts on this earth, if you are free from all of your physical earthly chains, but you do not belong to Christ Jesus, you are more in debt than you could ever get out of. You are more of a slave than you could ever free yourself or that any war could free you. Proverbs 5.22 says, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be Holden with the cords of sin, his own to man, his own sins, his own iniquities shall take the wicked himself. He shall be bound up in his own iniquities and he shall be holden with the cords of sin. Listen to me. Sin is a trap that ensnares you. Sin is a trap that ensnares you. Now, here's the thing about traps. A properly made bird trap which is something that the Bible refers to a lot is the idea of catching a pheasant or a bird. A properly made pheasant or bird trap is one that the bird cannot escape from on his own accord. Somebody's got to go over and let that bird out. Does that make sense? Well, sin is the perfect trap. And when you sin, which all of us are born into sin, all of us are, all of us are born into iniquity, when we sin, we have trapped ourselves. We are trapped in sin. Now, just like the bird that has trapped themselves in sin, we cannot do anything 
by works to get us out of that trap. We have been ensnared. It doesn't matter how much we kick and scream. It doesn't matter how much we declare ourselves to be righteous. Folks, let me tell you something. A guilty man cannot stand before a judge and say, I am not guilty. Somebody's got to provide the proof. Somebody's got to stand in your place and say, this man's innocent. That man's Jesus. John 8, 36. If the Son thereof shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Likewise, if you are bound by every chain on this earth, or if you are under the most suppressive forms of slavery, if you have gotten yourselves into every sort of contract, bound by every sort of debt, yet you have Christ Jesus, then you are freer than any man who is free from his earthly sins. He has made you free. He has cut the chains that weighed you down. He has taken the cage off of you. He has offered you and extended you this freedom that no matter how hard you work, you cannot gain for yourself. God did that. That is how much God loved liberty. The freedom of His children. For a short while we suffer here on earth, but when we get to heaven one day, there will be no more suffering. There will no more, be no more bounds, no more chains. There will be no more hurt, no more pain. There will only be freedom in Christ Jesus. And we will live in holy communion with God the Father. This freedom that God so desires, He has just as in our declaration where it is declared all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator right to liberty. Second Peter 3 9 says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness but is long suffering to us word not willing that anyone should perish but that all should come to repent. Folks this offering to be free, this calling to be free, has been extended to all of us. Why? Because we were all made in the image of God. We are his prized creation. And he sees his prized creation trapped. Now here's the thing. That bird, if the cage is lifted off of that bird, and the bird doesn't go anywhere, and he's still trapped. And he's still going to get caught. He's still going to get cooked. He's still going to get eaten. Folks, God has offered us freedom. Yet some of us refuse to take it because we love life inside the cage. And that's what they're trying to do to this country. The people that hate this country are trying to turn this country into a very well-dressed cage so that we don't question what's going on. I'm going to tell you a story about how to trap a hog. Somebody told me this. It makes sense. If you want to trap a hog, you put out some corn, and you put up one section of a wall. Eventually, the hogs will get used to that one section of the wall, and they'll come over there because there's corn there. And they'll eat, and they'll ignore that one section of the wall. Next week, you put up another section of the wall. Right now, the hogs are a little leery at first, but they come back because there's corn, there's food. Let another couple weeks go by, and then you put up the third section of the wall, so on and so forth, until finally you put on that fourth section that has the door. Now they're leery of it, but there's food inside of it. They're fed, they're comfortable. So they go inside of this perfectly made trap, and once they get inside, it slams shut and they've captured the hogs. But here's the thing the hogs don't care. They've got food. Sin is like a jail cell filled with everything in this earth that you could want and desire. And here's the thing, that while you're, while you're alive, that cell door is wide open. You could leave at any point. God has unlocked the door. You are free to leave that jail cell at any point, yet... So many people find so many comforts inside that jail cell to keep them there until one day we die. 
and that cell door slams shut. And now that jail cell takes on a whole new meaning. It's beyond this world. Folks, God has offered us freedom from this. That's how much he prizes it. Number three, the last, the last of these virtues, the pursuit of happiness. It's important that you pay attention to these words here. The pursuit of happiness. Because our founding fathers did not guarantee anybody happiness. Listen to the words. What does it say? The pursuit of happiness. Equal opportunity will always infinitely be better than equal outcome. And we've forgotten that. We have grown to prize equity more than equality. Yet people can be equally poverty, can they not? People can be equally enslaved, can they not? That would be a form of equity. Yet if everybody is given the equal opportunity, then we can rise. Listen to me. All are called by God. All have been given this equal opportunity to come to the throne of grace, to shed off their sins and that which weighs them down, and find mercy in Christ Jesus. All are called, but few will come. Few will answer that call. He has stretched the invitation of redemption and freedom towards you. And I'm going to ask you, will you answer this call? I'm going to read to you a couple more scriptures. First one is found in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55, 1 through 7. I want you to listen to this. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me here, and your soul shall live." and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Listen to this, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Listen to the very first verse again. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Ye come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why is it important that we come without money and without price? Because there is nothing that we could give God in exchange for our souls. There is nothing that we could do. There is no amount of good works. There is no amount of gold or riches that we could prevent, present towards God and say, hey, will this make me clean? There is nothing. God asks us to come empty handed. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight: 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. He repeats that call that we heard in Isaiah 55. If you are labored, if your sins weigh you down, even if you pretend like they're not there, I know that you feel them, and you know that you feel them. Christ doesn't ask you to come with anything. He doesn't ask you to perform any kind of righteous deed. All he wants you to do is come forth and lay your sins at his feet, and he takes care of the rest. No, he took care of the rest on the cross. It's done. It's paid for. And Christ has extended that opportunity of freedom to all. The pursuit of Christ Jesus, we are guaranteed. 
but Christ himself we are not guaranteed unless we fall down and repent of our sins and call upon him as Lord. Then, Christ and freedom, we are guaranteed. If you've not made that decision today to come before God and lay your sins before Him and make Him your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would make that decision. I pray that you would be moved by the Holy Spirit and you would obey the Holy Spirit's calling. If you have any other decisions, joining the church, baptism, or if you simply want to come forward and lay your sins at the altar, just be obedient to the Holy Spirit's calling in your life now. Thank you.